Well, you all probably remember that Lent started back on Ash Wednesday. Now we're past day number 10 of the 40 days of Lent. Last week we talked about how Lent is a time to get our lives back in sync with the way they should be, the way God wants us to live. So I hope you're doing something maybe a little bit different for your faith life during this season. And if you haven't started yet, it's not too late. You can take up something, you can give up something to bring you closer to God. Now today and for the next four weeks in worship, we'll be looking at parts of the reading for Palm and Passion Sunday. And Stacy told me that you usually concentrate on Palm, the Palm Sunday reading on that day. But I've usually addressed the the long, long gospel reading of everything that happened to Jesus in the days leading up to the crucifixion. Because that passage, um, we read part of it from Mark this morning, is packed with, with all of these smaller stories of what happened along the way. And our story this morning is one of those. Throughout the rest of the season of Lent, I'm going to share with you each Sunday a part of this, uh, of Jesus' journey to the cross using Mark's gospel as our guide, which is why I've asked you all to read the 14th chapter, I guess it's all the 14th chapter, of uh, of Mark's gospel. Um, These stories will help us understand how the whole world was out of sync in those days, much as it is now and how Easter is the attempt to bring us back in sync, if we let it. So this story um, is told in all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, so you probably have heard it before. Today we're going to concentrate on how Mark tells the story. And frankly, no one knows for sure if something like this happened to Jesus more than once, or if the writer's Um, put their own spin on what happened and ended up with four different stories. But that's not really important for us today. According to Mark's gospel, on Wednesday evening of Holy Week, Jesus and his disciples were having dinner in the house of a man in Bethany, which was about two miles from Jerusalem. The man was known as Simon the leper. You might remember other stories uh, from other stories that lepers were outcasts. They were contagious. They were shunned. No one would ever, ever sit down and eat with somebody who had leprosy. So evidently, Simon had been healed, maybe even by Jesus, but the name leper still stuck. So maybe this dinner for Jesus and his gang was a thank you of sorts for that healing. When we read the story from John's gospel, um, John says specifically that the woman was named Mary. Um, who anointed Jesus' feet. And she was the sister of Martha and Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So then we automatically assume that this was a dinner thanking Jesus for bringing Lazarus back from the dead. With Mark, we're not quite so sure. But what we do know, as Mark tells the story, is that at Simon's home, this group of men would have been reclining on low couches or pillows around the table, and the the table itself would have been quite low. So the, the disciples would have been leaning back on their left elbow and reaching out with their right hand to, to take the food from the table. That was the standard position for eating in Palestine at the time. And while they were reclining there at the table, this unnamed woman barges in, barges in, and pours a vial of very expensive perfume or ointment on Jesus' head. It was a perfume called, called nard. Nard was imported from the Himalayan mountain region of India. It was a rare and precious and very expensive commodity. Some scholars suspect that it was an heirloom passed down from generation to generation in this woman's family. And it was worth about 300 denarii, we're told. That doesn't mean a whole lot to us unless we do the research. And while estimates vary, it was equivalent to what a laborer might make for an entire year in those days. $50,000 or more. It was worth a lot of money. And she just poured it all over Jesus. I also read that it had been, it had, um, that it would have been in a sealed jar and that it had to be broken in order to use it. There was no unscrewing the cap and using a little now and a little later. And the disciples reacted instantly, scolding her for her waste. 
In John's account, it, is, it says that Judas is the one who chastised her. But here in Mark, it says some, meaning more than one of them. See, this was the night before Passover too, when it was customary for the Jews to remember the poor at that time. And they raised a perfectly legitimate concern in complaining about this woman's behavior. Think of how much good that money would have done if they had sold the expensive stuff and used the money to house and feed people in need. I kind of wave that argument lots of times when we're buying things or when I'm buying things that I know I shouldn't buy and I could be giving that money to somebody in need. Maybe that would have helped them get medical treatment or give shelter to orphans. Who knows? They had a valid point. But Jesus silenced her critics. Let her alone, he said. She has performed a good service for me. She has anointed my body for burial, he says. So think about this. That aroma, that scent that was now on his body all the way down to his feet would stay with Jesus for the remaining days. With each breath he took during those last two days of his life, he would breathe in the reminder that someone at least got it, got his message, understood his life when often his closest friends did not. We don't know for sure whether this woman who anointed Jesus saw her actions as a prelude to his upcoming death and burial or not, but I suspect she must have known instinctively that a man who dines in the house of a leper, who allows a woman to touch him in public, who rebukes Pharisees and befriends prostitutes, would not survive long in the world in which they lived. I was reading some stuff about this passage and ran across a bit by a woman who told the story of owning a rabbit. And he was a small brown rabbit named Peter, of course as most rabbits are. We've been there and done that. <clears throat> and if you know anything about rabbits, they have this natural defense mechanism that they mask any signs of being sick. And that's because in the wild, if a rabbit looks sick, it's easy prey to a predator, so they instinctively hide their symptoms. Well, then one day she noticed that little Peter rabbit looked sick. And she knew what to expect. But she gathered him up and rushed him to the vet anyway, telling herself that she wouldn't spend too much money on this little creature. But at the suggestion of the vet, she did, of course. She did spend a lot of money to nurse him back to health, or at least try to. And she wrote on her blog, It all makes me sad, but also grateful that our little hearts can expand so much with love, stupid love, that makes us do stupid things because we really are tender little creatures ourselves. Stupid love makes us do stupid things, she said, like spending wild amounts of money on a tiny little creature whose time had come. But she did it because it was the only thing she could do, the only thing she knew how to do at the time, and when she knew she had to do something. And she related uh, to this woman in Mark's gospel who anointed Jesus and said, it is stupid love, stupid, crazy love that seems to spill out of her unrestrained. She has done the only thing she knows how to do. Here she is in the middle of Lent when we're all, trying our, uh, uh, we're all busy trying our hardest to keep from eating chocolate or meat or whatever it is that we might have given up or to be more disciplined in our prayers or we're cleaning out our overstuffed closets and she's pouring a year's worth of wages all over Jesus' head. One commentator writes that this unnamed woman reminds us not to confuse discipline with discipleship. For though discipline does carve a pathway for us to follow towards spiritual health and growth, there will be times when, G when God simply asks you to follow, to act, to pour out everything you have and everything you are in lavish, extravagant, ridiculous, stupid love. That's a lot to swallow in our world today, to give more than what is expected. We can compare our woman today to another woman that Jesus talks about, a widow who gave all that she had. 
when she put her coin in the temple treasury. And sure, you could argue that the monetary values were vastly different, but for both women, their generosity cost them. And they both acted out of love and faith. But we live in a world today that says, what's the least we can do to get by? Hmm? What's the least we, amount we can, uh, uh, what's the least amount of care we can give to our homeless or our seniors or our veterans? What's the least we can do to protect our children in schools? Would it be a waste if we were to be extravagant in those things? Or would Jesus call it a beautiful thing if our kids were safe and the least among us cared for? Theologian Paul Tillich called this woman's act a holy waste. It was the kind of act done out of extravagant love and impulsive generosity. You could also think about it this way. God wastes beauty on us every day. God throws around the most beautiful paintings in creation and they get wasted on us all too often. Every single day, a gorgeous sunrise appears or a spectacular sunset uh, recedes over the horizon, whether we see them or not. But God still does it and continues to do it, and I don't think plans on stopping anytime soon. And that, my friends, is crazy, stupid love. Let us pray. Oh, holy God, we pray that each of us may feel free to waste our lives on Jesus and to be able to give the most precious parts of our lives and pour them all over Jesus with extravagant love.